Well, welcome to our next uh, live stream as part of the Research Week. And it's wonderful to have on the panel with me as we're going to take a look at the interesting topic of, of looking at how we use media effectively, sharing stories and knowledge to a wider audience. And to help me do that, Liz Minchin, the senior editor from The Conversation, is with me. Welcome, Liz. Thanks for having me. And uh, probably it's uh, one of those interesting things, Spencer. We, we know your voice, but we don't necessarily know <laughs> what you look like. And Spencer House and his... Um, well known across uh, certainly around uh, Brisbane market and the uh, uh, Brisbane presenter for the breakfast program on 612 ABC Brisbane. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. But also of course a wealth of experience uh, across the ABC and, and in broadcasting. And uh, finally but by no means least mm -hmm. is our Director of uh, Corporate Communications at USQ, Dr Aidan Burke. Thanks so much. Good to have you all Appreciate with us. It. I thought what we might do is uh, we'll start off, we're going to come to our audience uh, here at Springfield uh, when uh, we can with regard to some questions, but we thought we might just warm it up a little bit to really get a context around the idea of using media effectively. And I guess it's multi-layered in the sense that, uh, you know, we, we are challenged by that every day in the broad context. But when we come to looking at it in research, um, there's a few uh, ways in which we need to think about that. Liz, what is probably the, the, the thing that you find most confronting? What do we know least uh, when we come to you uh, as researchers? Uh, we know our topic, but we may not necessarily know how to share it with the media. Uh, well, I think the crucial thing is it's not so much thinking about the media, it's thinking about your audience. So whether you're thinking about talking to the conversation or talking to the ABC or even talking to your academics, some topics are better suited to, is this something, information you should be sharing just with your colleagues? In which case you can use jargon, you can use things that only they will understand. But if you're actually trying to reach a broader audience, let's say you want to talk to Spencer's audience or the conversation, we try and edit everything so that a, six, someone with a 16 year old level of English literacy can understand it. Um, in that case, you really need to think, okay, well, first of all, so what? Why do they need to know this? Why is it interesting enough? But also, how do, they, how do I then communicate it in a way that, to be honest, you've got to be, make them interested straight away. You've got to grab their attention and then hang on to it. And that so what question, um, and thinking and being respectful of people's time. So everyone's busy, everyone's, your audience essentially is incredibly busy. So you're asking for their time. How are you going to earn it? I know the 612 office is very busy uh, and you're, you're constantly inundated by uh, a whole range of people wanting to get some airspace. Is that true for you, Spencer, where well, obviously time is poor there, uh, but uh, getting that message, do, do we do that well as researchers? The, the reality um, with my program, which is the breakfast program on the ABC in Brisbane, is that uh, I'm on air for three hours, but if you take a really close look, there are about four interviews total per day. And we probably get 60 pitches of stories a day. <laughs> um, uh, so thank you to the, the PR professionals who send those out. Um, but uh, there's a certain pride sometimes in not automatically using a media release. So that's the first thing I suppose I would say. Um, uh, secondly, uh, the, the what, what do you call it? The what if, uh, so, so what, the so what yes, question. So what. All right, so uh, you know, we, every decision we make has the audience at the center and, and the way we ask uh, the question about what we are going to put on is, uh, is it uh, certainly for 612 in Brisbane, is it local? So we're looking for, if the research is being done in Southeast Queensland, tick, uh, is it timely? So is it about to be published or has just been published or, uh, or you are currently looking for participants for the study? So that's the timely. Uh, and, but useful is the, third, is the third one. That's the so what question. Uh, why, why should a, a, a family busy with a lot of noise in the kitchen at 7 o'clock in the morning stop for four minutes to listen to hear about your research? What's in it for them? Sound familiar, Aidan, <laughs> in what you <laughs> grapple with in too, the office? Too, too familiar. Um, look, I think I agree with all of the uh, what uh, Liz and, uh, and Spencer has said there. I think from a, uh, from a, 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 I guess, a public relations perspective, one of the biggest challenges is, is the pitch, I guess, uh, looking for the news angle, um, particularly keeping in mind everyone has said audience, and audience is 
the prime motivator, I guess, or the driver mm. that sits behind um, getting your information out and, and who you're going to speak to. And I think in many instances, researchers have to practice and practice hard as what we call, I guess, and you've heard it before, the elevator pitch. You know, how do you actually tell someone in less than three minutes everything about your, your ARC grant or your PhD topic or whatever it might be? It's very, very meaningful for you, but actually if you can explain it in terms that others are going to understand, you know, inside of three minutes or sometimes 30 seconds that you have um, and get that in, across in intelligible and in a comprehensible way, that's the big issue, I think, in many instances. Can I just I'd even say, like, our interviews on breakfast will go three or four minutes. Minutes, the pitch is the subject line of the email and yeah. I'm delete because if you think about how many people are pitching stories at me every day I delete most of them without even opening the email and that's that's <laughs> true for us too I mean we at the conversation we're actually because we are a collaboration with unis we are committed to reading all of the pictures but we actually ask on our pitch page um, if you go to the conversation there's a pitch as an idea We've got, first of all, in one sentence, what is your story? And then we actually, we're kind then, and we give people two, one to 200 words to say, you know, including in bullet points, okay, give us a bit more information. But that one sentence, we know that when we look at that pitch, if they don't get that one sentence and then being generous, the 200 words, if they can't communicate it well in that space, they're not gonna <coughs> do it well in 800 words. And 800 words, which is our standard length, is long in the media context these days. In, in a typical newspaper, I, my background is in newspapers, let's say at The Age or the Sydney Morning Herald, a typical lead news story used to be, say, 700 words. It's been crunched down to about 450 now, and that's a big, you know, crucial story. So, um, and for radio, absolutely. But if you think of it as a job interview, it's, you don't walk in and kind of go, well, I'll, let, I'll warm up a little bit first and eventually I'll get good. It's a, you have to walk in and make a good impression, and it's the same thing. That might sound daunting, but the one thing I'd say is, um, and in journalism we got taught this, it's the pub test. It's the, let's say mm. you're a PhD researcher, someone says to you at the pub, what's your topic? Now, if you do a long, well, I'm investigating this thing, but I'm not quite sure where it's going yet. And eventually you can actually see, physically see people's eyes glows over and they desperately look around the <laughs> pub for someone else to talk to. What we're looking for is the, the essentially the summary of your PhD where someone leans in and goes, oh, that's really interesting, mm. so tell me more. <laughs> that's what we're trying to get you to do. And, and I would say that it can sound daunting if you're not practiced at it, but practice is, mm. is, makes yeah. perfect. And, yeah. and with practice, you can take someone who's really shy and a little bit nervous and see them blossom into a fantastic mm. performer. Mm. Does that sound a bit uh, familiar for those <laughs> undertaking some research? A few nods around the yeah. room. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, think, I think it's important, though, that people understand that you're not dumbing down their, no, yes. their research in any way, shape or form. You're just making it understandable. Accessible. And accessible to, to, uh, to a lot of people. Bearing in mind that newsrooms, as Spencer said, there's hundreds if not thousands of media releases that actually come in via email uh, into their inbox every day. Now yours has to sit above that. Whether that's sort of the quirky headline or, or you know, the lead sentence or whatever it might be um, in order to get people interested. Um, but, you know, so be it. You have to really sort of practice at that. I remember working for a university which will, will remain nameless, not this one, um, and uh, we were looking at milking uh, barramundi fish, you know, taking eggs out of barramundi fish. And the biologist thought, oh, gee, this is, this is a really gung-ho story. And I thought, well, how are we going to sort of really sell this? You know, we're just milking the eggs out of barramundi fish. And we had to get the, uh, the eggs up into a hatchery up in Cairns in a short period of time. Otherwise, the, the, uh, the eggs would die and they'd be useless. So um, we pitched the story and I put it out as this particular university involved in Australia's biggest airlift operation to save thousands of babies. <laughs> in fact, the commercial, one of the a couple of the commercial television stations actually flew their helicopters up from Brisbane uh, to do it. So it's really looking at what is the wider audience, what's going to be interesting, what's going to sell the news, because in many instances the news are organisations, they have to keep an audience, they've got to keep a product, um, and they've got to be part of that product and their brand sits behind what they sell and how they sell it. Um, so it's important to, uh, to be aware of that. And before we came to air too, we were talking about the idea that within this context we're talking about not only the, the message that might be about a particular body of research, but also research itself to how to go seeking funding to, to look at how you make yourself attractive to a corporate. And again, the same principles apply, being able to get it quite succinct with passion and, and hook, hook an audience. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I guess it really is, and I, I'll you know, let Liz and, uh, and Spencer talk to this as well. But from a researcher, sometimes the media is not your audience at all. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, you know, you're not selling to them. I mean, you don't even want to talk to them. I mean, it's the it's the funding bodies that you, you know are going to you know, support you and and whoever it is. So it's finding out who in those organisations are, are the opinion leaders who are actually going to stamp or in fact influence someone else. Uh, in that organisation or government department or whatever it might be about what your project is and how it actually fits into maybe the, the, the current agenda that that organisation or that government department or whatever it is, uh, is running. So, you know, 12 months ago, your, your particular research uh, may not have seen the light of day, but all of a sudden there's government policy which is pushing in that area. You have to be aware of those sorts of things. So um, taking into account how does, my, how does my research fit into not only a media interesting perspective, but then how does um, a, a government or a funding body uh, going to support that, but more importantly then, if the government or funding body supports that, how are they going to win votes from it as well? <laughs> you know, so sure. it's a whole sort That's of domino actually, effect. It is an incredibly important point, and audience, that is, for, my starting point is always time, bearing in mind paying, being respectful of people's time, but then the first thing really is figuring out the audience, and you're absolutely right, mm. sometimes the audience isn't the general public, sometimes mm. it isn't you know, the local major newspaper or something. Sometimes it is a key group of funders. In fact, your vice uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research just was telling us a great story about how, when he worked in venture capital, he managed to raise $20 million with 15 PowerPoint slides. Now, obviously, it wasn't the PowerPoint slides that did oh, it. Pretty it powerful was PowerPoint slides. Pretty powerful <laughs> PowerPoint slides, but, um, but it was the story that went with it. And, I mean, if you're pitching for funding, as so many people do, whether that's on paper with an ARC grant or talking to someone or you get to talk to a politician, you might get to bump into the Premier, how are you going to sell the importance of your research? And it comes back to the so what question. People aren't going to fund something if they don't think it matters, if they don't think it's going to help. So first of all, if you're passionate about your area, again, kind of for people going, oh God, I'm not that good a storyteller. Well, if you care about your work, that comes across. Um, and also just, yeah, just um, practicing that story with people until you can kind of go, well, that bit of the story didn't work, that bit did, and practicing that mm. until you get good at it. Mm. Every story is good. There are no bad stories. You mm. just have to find the, the point of connection with the audience. And uh, Liz called mm. it the, the pub test. Um, just put the piece of paper down, put your research down, and, and how you literally, I'm sitting next to someone at the bar on a, uh, on a business trip, and, and you've got to explain it to them. They've got no background, they know nothing about your research. How do you explain it to them? Well, you're not going to go off on some tangential waffle because that's not how normal interactions <laughs> over beers occur, or cups of tea, if you like. Just, yeah, cut to the chase, that's your pitch. And when we're writing uh, intros to introduce stories for our listeners, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. I might have read, I read a paper yesterday on uh, debt in local councils because Somerset Council has just announced it's debt free. So I found myself reading a paper out of Adelaide from, from last year. Um, well, I've got to sell that to my audience as well. It's this, exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just really, just find that, that point of contact. Mm -hmm. Make them care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the hardest thing, but it's also incredibly mm -hmm. important. I will also say, apart from media or talking to funders, there's also there are new avenues that didn't exist even a few years ago. So social media, again, people might go, well, I'm not very good on the Twitters and I don't know about the Facebook and all that stuff. But actually, you can actually address a really massive audience. Even coming here today, I tweeted that I was coming here in the space of very little time. Uh, 612 had retweeted me, people here on campus had retweeted me. So quite quickly, I talk, told people I was coming and reached a bunch of people. Let's say you're doing research into a particular trout research or oceans research, you could do hashtag oceans or hashtag and you don't just make up the hashtag, you go looking for something relevant. Suddenly you can reach a bunch of people who aren't following you but do follow that subject. So the opportunities, people can get really down about the fact that it's so hard, it's so difficult. To be honest, there are more opportunities than there have ever been. I actually reckon it's a really exciting time to be sharing your research. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I thought it might be good to uh, just to take a moment because uh, for many of you here and uh, those watching may not be aware of the conversation and I was very mindful that we have kind of launched straight into our conversation around this but but it's been good to set that kind of background. Uh, we are obviously aware of the ABC but I thought it would be good to come mm. back to you Spencer a bit more about that because it's not always just breakfast either and I think it'd be good to unpack a bit more about the strength of the ABC. But Liz, uh, we do have a, a graphic, we can just show that uh, with where you started off uh, in 2011, I yep, think it was. Uh, and if we can take a look at that. Uh, well, this is, we've gone from in 2011, we launched from Melbourne. It was a small startup that no one had heard of. Now this is today. So we've actually, the little blue dots that you can see are where we have people based. So mm -hmm. we've got people around Australia, including two here in Brisbane. 
uh, Jakarta editor, a team in the UK, a team in the US, a team in South Africa and actually as of a month ago a team in France. And the whole idea is to create a growing global network so that, as everyone knows, research is not just about Australia. Some research is just Australian, but mostly we're talking about global topics, water, energy, uh, climate change, whatever mm. it might be, education. Um, so we've got this growing global network and we're publishing, and the whole idea of the conversation is everything we publish is published under Creative Commons, which basically means it's free to share, free to republish, free to read. Um, and that means we've been republished and are republished on a really regular basis in places like the Washington Post, CNN, um, for people who like Facebook, I effing love science, I won't say the whole name. Um, that's got, it on its own has 22 million followers. So if you love science and you're interested in, in sort of seeing good science stories, every, we get probably several stories a week just through the FM alone. That's reaching millions and millions of people. So. We're not just dependent. The old model of media is based on we assume you're listening to us. And so, and it's fantastic for us and we work really closely with other media organisations including 612 ABC and other ABC networks to share our stories with them. Our model is not about we assume you're coming to the conversation. It's about how do we get these good research stories out to the world and making it easier for them to share it. Liz, the pub test. What is the conversation? <laughs> <laughs> OK. I should have practised this myself. Um, right. So it's a not-for-profit, um, basically it's a translation service. So instead of it being, um, you know, you as the scientist or you as the education expert and me as the journalist, having a conversation where, as a journalist, I try and figure out what you're saying and take it away and translate that for you. We do that translation together. Um, so nothing that we publish is published without you seeing the final version. And that means that the final story is accurate. Um, it, it sums up the story really well, but importantly, it's also plain English. So, you know, you as the expert sometimes will say, blah, 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 you know, use a particular jargon phrase. My job is to ask the stupid questions and I have to say there are no stupid questions. If someone doesn't understand what you're saying, so as a journalist, I need to say, I don't understand what that means. I don't understand that phrase. Can we explain that better? Um, and so basically we're translating complex topics into plain English is probably the, the one line. Sure, okay. But I think more importantly, from the conversations perspective, it's not just the media that you're getting to, the media in the broader sense, social media, the tr traditional media and so on, but it's also the, the, the collaborative efforts that you can probably link with other like researchers. As Liz says, now, you know, elsewhere across the globe. Um, people who will pick up and say, well, that's the sort of an area that I'm researching in, will make contact with you um, through email, whatever it may be. And all of a sudden you, 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 you find that you're now part of a global group of interested scientists or researchers in that particular area. And it comes back to what you were saying too before, Liz, where it is dealing with those who us who are time poor. Yep. So we can make those kind of connections fairly quickly and quite accurately. Well, I can give it the best way to explain things usually is with a story. So to give an example of how we work, there's a guy at the University of Queensland called Peter Ellerton. On his own, he's had more than a million readers. Now, he doesn't write about sex, drugs or rock and roll. He writes about critical thinking. But there's an audience for critical thinking and he does it well. So, for example, just before Christmas, he published a story with us on critical thinking that on its own reached about half a million readers. That single article went right around the world. Um, and led to just around Christmas time, we got a phone call out of the blue saying, oh, I've just read your article in the conversation, it's really interesting. We'd like to invite you to an international symposium on critical thinking being held in South Africa next year. And Peter was going, sounds great. He was trying to actually interrupt and say, yes, count me in. And now obviously, you know, obviously it's a long way to come. So can we sweeten the deal with a three-day safari? So I like to say that the conversation leads to safaris. <laughs> Not strictly true in every case, but true in some cases. This is sounding good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I would also say that's one example of how that, you mm. know, exposure mm -hmm. to everyone from 20% of our audience is academic, but 80% is not. So we're assuming you could be an expert in critical thinking or you could know nothing about it. We have to talk to all of those people, which is hard, but it's fantastic when it works. Mm. Equally, we're not counting on reaching half a million people and people can sometimes get a bit caught up in who's got the biggest audience. It's not about the biggest audience, it's about the best audience for you. Mm -hmm. So again, Spencer is fantastic. If you want to talk to Brisbane, you want to be on Spencer's show. Um, but so another example, we ran something recently an article that had around 4,000 readers, and that might not sound very successful, it was an article about the Papua New Guinea drought um, by someone from um, ANU. Now, is that a successful story? Well, on the numbers, no. Well, in fact, that got republished by the United Nations Disaster Prevention Network and got shared among its experts. So not only was he 
informing people in PNG, and we can track where it was read, but it was also informing the international disaster response. So I guess it's for us, one of the reasons people do publish with a conversation, and you can see now our republishers, mm. those are some of our sort of mainstream news publishers, but you can see it's a real mix between big media outlets and it also, you know, Australian mining or regional media outlets. So we're not kind of discriminatory in terms of we only want to be republished in some places. It's no, we want to unlock knowledge and make it freely available and then get it out as widely as we can. So when we look at that and take that look at the next graphic, um, we, we, I think the next one uh, has a bit more of the detail uh, as well, because whilst I'm watching the graphic, I was too interested in <laughs> it. Uh, but um, but I, if we take a look at the next graphic, Flo, uh, that one I think uh, we start to see a bit more of the, uh, I think some of the global reach and the uh, social media for I remember correctly. Well, I can, I can without even seeing yep, it, sure. our social media reach is about 116,000 followers on Facebook. That's just for the Australian mm -hmm. conversation. There's obviously different ones for different, uh, for the US and others. Uh, Twitter is about 80,000. Well, 612 has got a pretty massive reach as well on mm -hmm. social media too. Mm -hmm. And that has a huge impact in terms of emergency response and things. Um, and, but again, in terms of it's a real mix from everyone to, you know, it might be academics or it might be teachers. Teachers are a big component of our readership. But it's also policy makers, a term I hate, but including politicians. So the Prime Minister follows us, Bill Shorten follows us, Julie Bishop follows us, um, and also people like Stephen Fry, Bill Gates, um, the Queen of Jordan. We've had some pretty interesting retweets. <laughs> um, so it's a really varied audience. But again, mm. I guess we're a good example of a really diverse audience. But again, sometimes, and I, I actually start all of my presentations by saying, I'm not going to assume that everyone here is going to write for the conversation. You might actually, you pro potentially shouldn't write for the conversation. All the advice mm. I'm going to give is about the process of developing stories, thinking about your audience, mm. pitching ideas, mm. because mm. It's, it is about targeting your story to the yeah. right place. Mm. Yeah, because you should give your stories to 612 ABC first. <laughs> <laughs> then you can go to the conversation yeah, later. <laughs> the graphics. But just getting into that, I mean, one of the things that uh, USQ has done fairly well, I think, has been the conversation. USQ is a great example. Actually, one of the things I love, and this isn't just about the conversation, it's about the age we live in, the internet and social media. I was saying before, so I'm probably talking too fast because I'm getting excited. Right. Um, passion is important. Uh, it's a great example of how you can live and work in somewhere like Springfield or Toowoomba mm. and be informing the world. So for instance, USQ has fantastic astrophysicists, so this great astronomy team. We publish, so USQ on its own as a uni has reached 1.4 million readers. Um, and so when we've run series on discoveries on Mars or discoveries on Pluto or amazing sort of meteor showers or whatever, mm. we publish people, we've had former chief scientists of NASA write for our Conversation US team for instance, but in the mix there are John T. Horner and the others from USQ. So again, in terms of um, one of the old challenges was that tyranny of distance, which applied for all of Australia. Mm. It was so mm. far from everywhere. Well, now we can actually, even even social, again, forget the conversation, being active on social media, I shouldn't say that probably, <laughs> but being active on social media, you can be talking to someone on the other side of the world mm. who shares your passion mm. for that particular topic. Mm. So mm. again... So we see some of our USQ uh, impact there. If we take a look at the next graphic, that's where um, our VC had been involved. Yeah, so in every that. month we actually report to our member unis like USQ on showing their thing. So that's Jonty's dashboard. So every author can see how, did, how am I going overall? How's this particular article gone? Where in the world have I been talking to? And you can see there that little pie chart. Hopefully that's clear for people. But you can see that the United States is actually his single biggest readership there. And I think it's um, US, Australia, and then UK after that. But um, USQ, off the top of my head, 60% of USQ's audience, 60% of that 1.4 million is actually global. So it's a fantastic mm. example mm. of a regional university informing the world. Mm. And are you finding that there's a big change because we've often had sort of like the group of eight and, and there was that kind of elitist um, structure within universities. But is that breaking down? Oh, I mean, broadly speaking, the group of eight do well with us because they're research intensive. But there are actually a number of unis. USQ is one of them, Griffith's another. There's a, I mean, um, I'm probably being skewed to, to, um, to Queensland because of being based here. But um, no, it's, it's really... It depends on the individual academics, but then also the universities rewarding that public engagement. And again, I'd say, in fact, your uh, DVCR was the same before, that USQ has a specific component on public engagement and encouraging that. So I'd say that if universities like USQ value their academics going out and talking to the public, whether it's on radio, whether it's through us or other avenues, you need to find ways to reward that. Um, so, um, so no, I actually would say that overall it's 
hungry universities often do really, really well, um, mm. and hungry academics as mm. well. Mm. I guess, uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, I was just going to uh, just add on from that. One of the, the, the great things is also the shelf life. Um, that people can actually get research and can get not only out of the conversation but the media in general. Um, it was a fantastic um, uh, a story and uh, it actually came out of Spencer's program some, some time back um, and we were doing some research and it was picked up uh, by the ABC and uh, it was about males wearing beards and how that actually uh, lessened the ultraviolet effect on, on people's faces. That story has been absolutely incredible and blows me where it has gone. Um, it's always viral from a mainstream media perspective because it has been... It, well, they picked up, up, but the story <laughs> itself, it was, it was picked up by the ABC and it was obviously then picked up by, by Reuters and other, other news agencies overseas. That story has, uh, has appeared and it comes out of our, physicist, our physics area physicists and uh, they were doing research obviously on the effects of uh, ultra ultra light, uh, ultra radiation and um, it has been picked up by the newspapers that cover all the baseball series in America and they've done profiles on players who wear beards <laughs> <laughs> going back to the research that USQ has done um, it's been picked up by most of the uh, Indian media because of the, the the people who wear beards absolutely incredible the shelf life and that's been going on now for I can probably think four or five years <laughs> every so often it comes up um, so yeah the shelf life of research is just incredible it's just not it's just not um, related to that piece of conversation at that point in time either on you know Spencer's program or in the conversation or whatever it might be it has a shelf life that goes on and in the earlier stages too of research and, and Spencer was very kind to help me out uh, I think 6.30 in the morning, so I guess if you need to be ready to be up early uh, to record the interview, but uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, again, uh, that came out of the idea of, I, I was looking for respondents um, where I'm doing my research around, funnily enough, about the value of broadcast radio. Uh, so, uh, you know, getting that word out and finding the interest, uh, you know, and who would be keen to follow. And, and certainly from that interview, uh, we, we've got a number of people phoning through so I remember four IP and you know wanting to tell me their stories some of them were good just to kind of connect with but others really led off to a whole range of other things and, and the Queensland Times ran a, a story for me and that helps and I guess it's important to recognize that mm. part of the mm. media too mm. uh, where it can help that work I know you, you've done quite a bit of that uh, but to you then Spencer with the ABC um, because I don't want to pick just on the breakfast program as much as we appreciate you and I, and I appreciate the relationship we have but but, uh, but in terms of the ABC more generally, how do we as uh, people coming from an academic background wanting to get our story out with the ABC more generally actually identify the right program and, and how do we make that contact? Uh, well, I, I, it's a good question. Um, I, I suppose, it, look, everything always comes back to the, that where we started, which is what's the audience that, that you want to hit. So if you want to, I guess if, you know, the ABC has such a suite of products across radio, television and online. Um, in South East Queensland, we have 10 radio stations now, um, thanks to digital radio. And of course, numerous television stations and, and online. So if, you, if, if Catalyst is, is your audience because you've, you know, you've got some major scientific breakthrough, um, that's deserving of that sort of national television treatment. I'm not going to hold you back and say, don't you know, don't do that. Um, but um, I, I guess I would say, and I, I, this, I'm, it's probably a bit of self-interest saying this, but because I need to fill a program every morning. But um, uh, you can certainly get some practice doing interviews by coming on the local station wherever it is. If you're in Toowoomba, um, ABC Southern Queensland uh, would love to hear from you if you have some research that you are doing in Toowoomba or on the Downs, and similarly myself from Springfield to, to the North Coast. Um, um, if you if it's got that local hook, that is one reason why we would do the story. Um, and then it's got to be picked up. You know, there's a feeding chain in the media. Mm. And tr traditionally it's been sort of newspapers and then the radio stations pick the stories up out of the newspapers and then TV stations at night will do the stories that were on the radio. But I think it's all become very blurred. Um, so if you've got a good story and you can get, get it out, um, I reckon, it, you know, it's going to sort of be picked up. It's going to be spread initially around the ABC and then beyond. We, the media all listen to, we all listen to the other radio stations for good stories. They listen to us. Um, and so, you know, a good story, as long as it has a strong starting point, is going to spread. For sure. And for those who might be struggling uh, within the organisation, is mm. that where you come in through the... Well, I, 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 look, 
It is, because I think uh, the Office of Corporate Communications is a sort of the main channel to get information about the university out into the public arena. The university also has a particular brand that it wants to uh, pursue and put forward, uh, and it, that sort of reputation. So the sorts of things that we might package as a research sort of tends to sit around what's the university's focus and where it wants to be seen and how it wants to be seen. Sometimes when we have a, this sort of a scattergun approach where everyone might go out independently to the media and do their own thing, um, either doesn't help them individually and then doesn't help the organisation as a whole as well because it's difficult to know um, what it is that you're trying to go out there, what's your identity of the organisation as moving forward. I think uh, it's important that um, that uh, if people are wanting to get their research out, come and see us at uh, Corporate Communications because not only do we um, niche um, target um, particular areas, as, as Spencer uh, alluded to before. Um, some areas in agricultural research, you won't see that in any of the mainstream or regional media. It's pitched particularly at uh, agricultural magazines and trade magazines and those sorts of things or, or um, uh, social media type, type organisations. And we have a large um, database that we work through AAP. Um, and they provide us with a database and distribution channel and we can actually peri uh, uh, cherry pick not only the, the research but also the target audiences of where that particular research might, might go and we use that through AAP uh, as well. Not only here in Australia but also overseas. Um, so we've got modules and packages uh, in order to do that. So. We do sometimes run agricultural stories on 612. <laughs> Can I just say, there was a, there was a great um, piece of research out of UQ a few months ago uh, where uh, wheat, I think it was some sort of disease, I didn't run the story on my show so I don't fully know the, the story, but basically there was some sort of disease in the roots of wheat and the researchers had worked out that by simply having a clear, like, or, like a glass flask that the, this wheat was growing in, they could see the roots and, they, and that helped with the research. Mm, mm. And I just, that's a great story. And the reason, the, the, where that connects to me as a city audience is, is you know, can, I, can I apply that with my garden at home? Now, I'm not a gardener, so I don't know the answer to the question, but it struck me that that was more than a wheat story. Mm. There's something just fundamentally amazing and fun <laughs> about the simplicity of that research. Um, so uh, if you do have great agricultural yep. and rural <laughs> stories, uh, what I'm saying is they don't all have to get a landline. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I think it was six, 12, if there's a connection to that do. city <laughs> audience. <laughs> yeah. that for sure, absolutely. <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm just thinking it might be worth uh, just also putting across to our audience here at Springfield if there's any questions you'd like to raise, it'd be good to, to hear from you. Uh, anyone would like to ask a question at the moment? Do we have to go Peter, to the mic? Yes, we do. We do need you to, uh, Peter's going to ask a question, just, I think. Just while he's on the way to the mic to fill the time, I should just say that we actually, at the conversation, we've got a, a sort of short guide to um, pitching and writing. Who's eligible um, uh, to write for the conversation? Um, everyone from PhDs up, but then also tips on pitching, tips on writing. I actually say that that guide's quite useful for even if, again, you never write for the conversation, mm. it's got some useful tips generally. So um, I will tweet that after this at Liz Minchin, um, M-I-N-C-H-I-N, not Ian. Um, and if anyone wants that, but we'll also make that available through USQ because I've updated it recently. But mm -hmm. So we do try and make it as easy as possible for people. Fantastic resource, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Um, really fascinating stuff. Uh, I might just add... Um, that uh, John T. Horner, who is our most prolific uh, conversation um, pr um, contributor, has just been promoted here, by the way, to yes. associate professor. Those two things may or may not Safari's be. Safari's information. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, uh, I've also written uh, for the conversation. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make this point as a researcher. Um, that it's a very liberating experience because unlike when we're writing normally for the, our scientific audiences, we're really constrained um, by our language and, and, and not straying off topic. Whereas it's, uh, it's such a creative experience writing for the conversation. And I know that there is a lot of talent around this university who have not yet put their hands up to do so possibly because they're maybe a little bit intimidated by the ones they read. But I just wanted you to, you know, the message you have for those people who have not yet, uh, you know, sought you out. Um, just how, I remember just how much help I got yeah. from, uh, from your staff in, in drafting what I was doing and, and crafting it, really. But it was, a, it was a great experience for me. Could you just comment on that? Absolutely. Well, I'll say two things. One is we have 17 commissioning editors here in Australia for the entire country 
So there is a decent chance that if you pitch to us, you will get a no. But even our very top authors get no sometimes. So if it's a no, don't go, oh, no, I'm terrible. I shouldn't be a storyteller. I shouldn't be doing it. Actually, there's a really good chance that it's just our resourcing. We are a not-for-profit. So I only say that because I want to encourage people to give it a crack. But give it a crack after they've followed our guide, which, again, they can read after this. Um, had, had some practice, talked to comms, that sort of thing. So do the um, preparation first. The second thing I would say is we can't control what stories go viral, but Jonty and the, the astronomy team, they're a fantastic example of if you're doing interesting research and, and you're passionate about it. In fact, I was just saying I've met the leader of the opposition here the other day and was telling him about the USQ's great work and um, he's a big astronomy fan. So you don't know, could be a you know, future Premier of the state yes. um, reading your article right now. So. Um, uh, not that I'm predicting anything about Queensland politics. <laughs> to say leader of the opposition was fan. Anyway, so That'd be no. better than a safari if you could do that. But the other thing I'd say is, you know, USQ is a member of the conversation. I'll be very keen to get around to all the campuses. Um, I'll be talking mm. to Aidan after this to hopefully get out to Toowoomba. Um, we've presented there before, but um, look forward to doing it. Come to our presentations, read our guide. We try and make it as open and transparent as possible. Um, but just give it a crack. And even if it's not writing for the conversation. Think about social media, listen to radio, even practice, you know, you've got fantastic opportunities here at USQ to even go on radio here so that your first time sitting down in front of a radio mm. mic isn't with Spencer, mm. it's in a much safer environment, even though it'll be, yeah. it'll be warm. It's safer. And, uh, I mean, it's in a, not in such a big audience, <laughs> but it'll be warm and fuzzy when you're with Spencer too. But no, we can't, we, it really is a collaboration between us. Um, you don't have to be scared when you publish with a conversation. We can't publish without your final approval, so we're trying to make it so that you're happy, we're happy, that means the audience will be happy. Um, so we really do try and make it as, as easy and, and good as possible. It is incredibly competitive now to get run, so that's the only thing I would stress. Um, but we, we do try and make it as, as enjoyable a process as possible. Mm -hmm. that's good. Good. Thank you very much, Peter. John, you've got a question. Yes, thanks, Ashley. Uh, uh, Spencer, this is probably for you, but I think Liz uh, might have an angle too. Um, no one probably better than you has promoted the utility of social media, Twitter, uh, Facebook, etc. over the last couple of years. I think probably I owe you a debt in that regard. Um, my question is really around uh, the use of social media, I guess by all of us these days, uh, and in a sense it bypasses email. Uh, and I guess the question is, how often do you find a story um, on your tweet feed, for example, or, or on Facebook. I mean, both of you are directly accessible, for example, via social media. Is that a medium, too, for finding interesting things these days that you find yourself following up on? Every day. Every day on every program there is a story that I have found on social media, too, from this morning's program. Um, one of them happened on Saturday morning, so it was no great surprise by the time I got to air today, but I was lying in bed Saturday morning. Uh, first thing I do when I wake up is uh, have a sip of coffee and then flick through uh, my Twitter before I put the radio on. And I think that's what we, we are recognising that that's what people are doing. They're looking at their Facebook or their Twitter before they put the radio on. And someone had tweeted a photo of Central Station in darkness. And I noted that. And then someone tweeted about traffic lights out at uh, the corner of Anne and Wickham. And then there was another similar tweet. And my wife, who, who produces the 7pm news for ABC, who was working on Saturday, I just shouted upstairs to her. I said, there's a big blackout in town. Like, from Central to the Valley train station is out. Mm. Think about all those high rises. Thank goodness there's no one in office blocks today. But, and it became a big story. So that wasn't a story that was useful for me. Mm. Uh, it was for her. And, uh, and that's an example of social media reporting something uh, as it's happening. Uh, similarly, on, uh, on the weekend, uh, Paul Tully, his uh, Ipswich councillor, had been concerned a couple of weeks ago about the jacarandas in Goodna not flowering in time for the jacaranda festival this weekend. Uh, not everything we do is, is high science. And um, uh, on the weekend, someone had sent me uh, a tweet just saying, oh, no, actually had posted a photo of a jacaranda somewhere in Brisbane, which prompted me to send Paul Tully a direct message saying, what are you doing Monday morning? It's about time we had an update on the jacarandas. Um, so every single day. There might be a bit of science in that, by the way. There is, our, yeah. It could be El Nino, for example. Yeah. Well, apparently you, you're supposed to whack the jacarandas with a lump of 4B2. And, and <laughs> no, this is like botanists were calling up to say this as well because it releases the hormones. I don't know. Suddenly we've got into gardening and science and I don't know what I'm talking about. But uh, yes, but every day, every single day. 
and you know, Twitter, like Facebook, your friends are on Facebook. And I just spoke to some of the students here and said to them, like, yeah, sure, your friends are on Facebook or your friends are on Instagram, but industry people are on Twitter. Mm. And if you want to connect, uh, and I would, I would think that would be the same with, with the science community. It certainly is with the media and politicians and people who want to get word out about something, Twitter is where that stuff is happening. Mm. You might not find your friends there, your mum might not be there, your grandma might not be there, but you'll get information and you'll get information out mm. there. I think it's important though, if you are using social media, I mean it is a, it is a tool, and there's so many other social media tools out there. Twitter is one, Facebook and, and LinkedIn and, and so on like that. Again, I think it's also important that you understand the language that each of those social media That's channels right. use. Because on Twitter you're, you're restricted to about 140 characters. Um, the language that you use on Facebook is not the same language that you'll use on LinkedIn um, because you're talking to a more professional audience and so on like that. So again, knowing your audience, knowing the language that they use and how you, get, how you use it in that space is chronically important because otherwise you might have something important to say, but if you're not saying it properly, uh, I might even give a little tip which might anywhere. help a few people. Even something as simple on Twitter as you'll so often see someone start a tweet with at, they want to send something to Spencer for instance or alert Spencer something so at Spencer House and blah 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 blah. You're only actually telling that to Spencer and everyone who follows Spencer unless you put another character. Well, no, like only a, people who follow the two of us. Yeah that's what I mean. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so I might, let's say I'm following you John, in fact mm. I do, I follow you John mm. and I follow Spencer, I would see that, but all of the other people that you might be hoping would see that won't yep. see that. So even something as simple as putting a little full stop first or writing something else before you say hi Spencer or whatever, um, something that's the language. Mm. So audience, it's very public and I would absolutely stress with social media, you want to be the grown up in the room, you don't want to say anything that, deleted tweets, forget about deleting things, it's public, everything that you say, in fact I would say email, everything that you do online is public, assume it's public, um, including direct messages and all that. Um, but so, but the, so the audience, but then also the language, so getting the mm. language right and getting a few tips. And uh, does USQ run social media training? Um, we do. Yeah. Um, well, that would be something to look I mean, if people put their hands up for it and say, look, you know, we want some social media training. Just recently there was a, uh, in the, the, the Red Train Research um, program, they did look at the use of social media around, around research. And I think people are now just starting to get into, into that space. Can I recommend yeah. there's a great um, it's LSE impact blog. Um, it's run out of, obviously, LSE in, in England. Um, they do really they publish really interesting stuff on the academic benefits of sharing stuff on social media. So it's, there's lots of good and growing number of studies looking at the value of sharing stuff on social media. So it's not just a kind of add on to, oh, I guess when I've done my study, I'll maybe think about that. You should be thinking about how am I going to, when you're doing any research, how am I going to communicate this? And again, not just, probably if I'd say the one difference between a successful research communicator and one that doesn't work well, I'd probably say is the attitude in terms of, I've got my research, I need to shove that out to the world, as opposed to that doesn't work and people can tell, as opposed to this is really interesting research, this will really help mm. or be useful or whatever to this audience, how can I share that with them? Mm. So it's the difference in, okay, I've got a you know, research requirement that I disseminate my research, I will disseminate it, as opposed to <laughs> the sharing and being excited mm. and recognising mm. the value and getting the audience right. That comes across in an instant, mm. um, and you can hear it on the radio, you can read it in our mm. articles. One of the good things, though, with, with social media, there are so many freeware tools in Google now, for argument's sake. If you want instant recall on how your social media is, is tracking and what the perception is and the sentiment value and who's reading it and so on like that, there is free, free tools out there that will actually track your, your, um, your tweet or whatever it may be and will give you instantaneous uh, feedback on how the rest of the world is perceiving you. Yeah. Yeah. Just a, a question, I guess, uh, the, in an area that we haven't really canvassed all that much, and that's the, the, the visual. I mean, the, the prints, uh, it's got its medium, and, and, and Spencer, the, 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 the audio world of radio, but uh, about TV, I mean, uh, is there, is there a, are there special demands, extra demands, that to make research interesting for TV because mm. that seems well, to me to be the highest benchmark mm. to achieve in getting stuff out. I'd say that even radio these days, the line is blurring between yeah. radio online and television. So a lot of what we, we had, um, you know, it's Back to the Future Day on Wednesday. It's the date in Back to the Future 2 when Marty and Doc will arrive from 1985. We know that's going to happen <laughs> with their hoverboards for all of us. Um, and so we had a, a DeLorean car uh, parked outside the ABC and I went outside and I spoke to the owner of this car and uh, we videoed it 
and put that straight away on our Facebook and Twitter and uh, it became one of our most shared posts on Facebook last mm -hmm. week. Uh, so that was radio but mm -hmm. someone had the time to come downstairs to the car mm -hmm. with me and to film mm -hmm. and it was a, a 15 second video mm -hmm. um, shot uh, and then speeded up eight times so no great quality in it but it just gave people in 15 seconds a complete panorama around this yeah. DeLorean. Mm -hmm. So in radio even, we're looking for pictures. Mm -hmm. But certainly if my, if my uh, wife were here, Nikki, who produces, as I said, the, the 7 o'clock TV news, uh, they've got to be pictures mm -hmm. for, for a TV story. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'll be, it would be a rare science story mm -hmm. that got to air without pictures of any sort. Mm -hmm. I mean, a picture says a thousand words, and I mean, many journalists these days, you used to have your camera operator and your journalist and your sound recorders. A lot of people are, you know, in the you know, small areas, probably the, a one-person band, basically. I've actually worked as that. So doing it, 612 you know? has a cross-media reporter, um, and that's basically you're working with, you're producing radio, you're producing video, and mm. you're producing online mm. text mm. content, mm. too, all of them together. Mm. And, um, and yeah, exactly, you have to think about all of those things, mm. and Spencer certainly is with all of everything that he's mm. producing too. Yeah. I would say, sorry, I'd say that yeah. if you can supply the vision, I mean, the ABC has certain policies when it comes to using supplied vision and audio. Mm. Um, uh, isn't certainly isn't averse to using supplied video, especially if it's of a scientific nature and it, you, it can't just be recreated by sending yeah. a camera crew along to yeah. USQ. Yeah. Uh, so if you can supply the vision, then uh, the right vision's gonna be used when the story goes to air, mm. and I think there's a lot of value in mm. that. Look, in many in many instances, uh, uh, news directors um, and chief of staff will send their journalists out, not about the story, but what's what's the vision that goes with that story. The story is secondary. Yes. It's what sort of is going to capture the imagination of the audience, and it always comes back to the audience and how you can engage with them, in, in, you know, through the vision or whatever it may be. Um, so it's the actual the visual is sometimes is the most is the more important or the priority uh, for the uh, for the newsroom rather than the actual words uh, it's that go very with true it. true in terms of commercial television, yeah. even more than the ABC, yeah. Uh, yeah. but there's always got to be strong yeah. pictures. Yeah. The other one too, I think, uh, John, is the um, capacity to look at the online delivery for television. Uh, mm. I know our work with Nine and Seven, mm. Um, mm. their online uh, channels, it does give an opportunity for an extended story. Mm. So mm. even like mm. ninenews.com um, .au would take a story that's two minutes long um, if it's got a local, and it comes mm. back to what Spencer mm. was saying, the mm. local angle, mm. uh, but they're very happy to mm. publish mm. those kind of stories. So but there's some other opportunities. But actually it's just not its just not the television or the traditional television stations, commercial television mm. stations that are taking vision. I mean you look at every newspaper now, yes. they have online Absolutely. and they have this insatiable ap appetite, not only for words, but they also need yeah. vision yes. that goes with it. And yeah. um, We publish and in, video as well, yeah. you get it into our stories. Absolutely. So any more, in, in uh, look, nine times out of ten, um, um, chief of staff and so on like that that I deal with will phone up and say, look, you don't even have to edit the vision. You know, just give us the raw footage. Mm. We'll do it. We'll put it together. Um, but that, we they would probably rather do we, the editing. They'd rather do the editing the because they'll, you know, move it to their story. Mm. Um, so, you know, they're after quality type stuff. But, you know, even iPhones these days have fantastic, um, or you know, smartphones, um, have fantastic capacity to, to do that. So it's it's um, thinking of your audience, thinking of the, of the vision, thinking of who, who it's going to be out there to. But in many cases, vision is the thing that actually grabs the, uh, the attention of the, uh, of the journalist. Does it mean that you're getting in your email inbox links to, uh, to YouTube kind, th kind of things? We've all got a TV camera these days. I mean, is that, is that the future too in terms of uh, the input that, that is pitching, I guess, to firstly the media to get the interest? It's not maybe the story mm. so much, but that initial interest that yeah. says... I mean, normally, the, uh, I suppose the media releases that I would see that have vision, it, it will say vision available, we, yeah. have, we have shot vision, because uh, I think no one wants to clog up inboxes, and I yeah. know the ABC inbox clogs very quickly and can't <laughs> deal with big files at all, so that's generally how it works. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we'll generally be told, and I in fact encourage people in the pitch, it's in our pitching guide too, so yeah. if, there's, if you've got photos, if you've got video, please tell us. We don't encourage people to send massive files to us. Yes, no, I'm thinking to, hyperlinks. Well, just to, the links. Files. to give an example of a story that I came across the other day just from being on a campus, I was at QUT in the city and um, they had a bunch of 
traditional science posters. So mm. most of the posters were very, very text heavy. The one poster that I gravitated, as in mm. these were TV posters, but they're mostly static images. The one that I immediately gravitated to was video, yeah. and it was about ag robots. So you could you could do a static slide about ag robots, but isn't it more powerful to actually show them in action, including not just sort of driving itself around the paddock, but eventually actually putting itself to bed back in the thing. So. Having watched that video, I then turned and started chatting to the researcher. That's going to lead to a story. So, um, so that's. But again, you're thinking like your audience in terms of, if you wrote an article for a newspaper or wrote an article for the Conversation and just said, "I'm going to tell you how great ag robots are." That's great, but I've n I probably haven't seen one as your audience. Mm. If you can show me how it works, that's much more compelling. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, the first principle of storytelling is really show, don't tell. Don't tell me something is amazing. Show me it is amazing. That's good. Thank you, John. And uh, we're just about out of time, but uh, just before we do go, I thought it might be good just to run across the panel uh, and look at any sort of final tips that you would like to give from your own perspective or perhaps more generally. Um, I just Put say, you on the spot, Yeah, <laughs> the first one. Uh, well, time, I just say, just remember time. Be respectful of people's time and the fact that um, you know, you're asking for the most precious resource that we have. So make it worth my time and I will remember it and I will tell my friends about your work. Um, and do your homework. So, so I think there was a question before about how do you know, you can see our little pitching guide there. And I would say this for anyone, um, if you want to write for the conversation, you need to read the conversation. If you want to be on 612 and do a good job, you need to listen to Spencer's show. You know, it's, it's a, if you don't know the tone and the language and the length, so if mm. someone comes on expecting to have 15 minutes of chatting to Spencer in prime time, well, you're probably not going to get that. So doing your homework really, really pays off. And I would say that's probably um, time and, and doing your preparation is, is probably, probably the two key things. Sure. Thanks, Liz. Spencer. I'll give you three things if you're going to pitch to me or pitch to 612. First, uh, a story. First of all, pitch to one presenter or one program at a time because we're not stupid. <laughs> and when everyone's computer goes ding at the same time and it's the same email pitching the same story to everyone, it's likely that we will on mass go, right, oh, let's all delete that and move on. Uh, that sounds kind of petulant, but I'm just telling you how it is. Um, pitch to one person the absolute show that you want to get on and if you get a rejection, say, OK, who should I pitch to? Because I'm always, my mind's, uh, I, if I open the email, so that's number one, you know, sell it in the subject line. Uh, once I've read it, if I don't think it's for us, the, if having read it, I won't just delete it. I'll go, that's a good one for Tim on weekend, or that's a good one for Steve. And I'll suggest back, why don't you pitch it to Steve? Second thing is the best time to pitch with radio is 90 minutes before a program goes to air, because that's when there's one gap left in the program. So if it's the drive show between 3 and 6, 1.30 in the afternoon is when they are going, I don't know what we're going to do at 10 past 4, one and a half hours before. And the last one is the key one. If there's one thing that has made life challenging for me over the years dealing with university media releases from not any particular universities. It's when the, the media release arrives and then the talent, the scientist, has gone off to New York for the week and isn't available. <laughs> and doesn't don't, have a mobile phone or never yes. uses it. <laughs> you would not believe, I don't know how that happens, but you would not believe the number of times it happens if you are going to send the media release, make sure that the person is available to be interviewed. Please. Uh, here, here. <laughs> I agree with you 150% on that one. Um, look, I, I think from my particular, from a, from a journalistic background, um, it's telling your story in 25 words or less. Um, practice, practice, practice is the main thing. But uh, going back to that old uh, adage of a, you know, a newspaper summary uh, article, say who, what, where, when, why and how. And if you can fit all of those elements into 25 words or less, you're 90% you're there of getting someone to actually understand what you're, what you're um, talking about. It's important to know your audience, of course. It's important to know the, the, the language that they use. And it's important, I think, as, as, as Liz, I think, uh, said before, if you're looking or going to a particular media, um, follow that media's tone, follow, follow the language, follow you know, who, who says it and how they say it and so on like that. If you can, it's not plagiarising their work, but if you copy their style and how they do things, again, it will get picked up and each medium is somewhat different. 
That's fabulous. Thank you very much. Wonderful tips and uh, wonderful mm -hmm. conversation. If I may borrow your title for a moment. Uh, <laughs> you haven't copyrighted the word yeah, conversation there, have you? <laughs> Richard Feidler's in trouble. Terrible, <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible trouble. Uh, and I, but just before we go, I guess that's a really good example, isn't it? I think it's a million uh, downloads Podcasts. for his uh, for the yeah, podcast, which right. just shows Huge. the interest that people do have in stories. And that shelf life of stories, mm, that is. Yeah, well. absolutely. Yeah, really so, look, thank you so much, Liz Minchin, for the conversation as the senior editor. Spencer Housen, 612 ABC Breakfast, we appreciate you. And mm -hmm. so much... Uh, Admirable uh, advice here internally <laughs> that you can get from Aidan and the department Absolutely. there within Corporate Comms, um, Director for Corporate Comms, Aidan Berg. That's Thank fine. you to you for joining us. Thank you for the people here who have been with us here at Springfield and for you online. And uh, we have more of the sessions here on Research Week through for 2015. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye for now.